Welcome back to Thursday Bible Study. My name is Cassie Waits, and I'm so glad that you're part of our conversation today. As we begin our time together, let's open with a word of prayer. Let us pray. Holy God, we thank you for this day and for the opportunity to gather together. We lift up to you our prayers this morning for those who are sick, for those who are recovering, for those who are lonely and isolated, and for all who live in fear, we pray. Lord, we also lift up to you praises. Praises for new life. Praises for the beautiful weather. Praises for the many blessings all around us and those reminders that you are with us. We praise you for the slower pace of life these days, for those who are growing closer to their families and friends, and for those who are growing closer to you. Thank you for providing all that we need. Help us to trust you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We are excited to welcome back Jean Burnett on the piano today. So let's join our voices together for our opening hymn, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. continuing our study of the parables of Jesus this week, we are digging into Luke chapter 16, the parable of the manager. Let's read together. Luke 16, 1 through 11. Then Jesus said to the disciples, There was a rich man who had a manager, and charges were brought to him that this man was squandering his property. So he summoned him and said to him, What is this that I hear about you? Give me an accounting of your management, because you cannot be my manager any longer. Then the manager said to himself, What will I do now that my master is taking the position away from me? I am not strong enough to dig, and I am ashamed to beg. I have decided what to do 
so that when I am dismissed as manager, people may welcome me into their homes. So summoning his master's debtors one by one, he asked the first, how much do you owe my master? He answered, a hundred jugs of olive oil. He said to him, take your bill, sit down quickly and make it 50. Then he asked another, and how much do you owe? He replied, a hundred containers of wheat. The manager said to him, take your bill and make it 80. And his master commended the dishonest manager because he had acted shrewdly. For the children of this age are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than are the children of light. And I tell you, make friends for yourselves by means of dishonest wealth, so that when it is gone, they may welcome you into the eternal homes. Whoever is faithful in a very little is faithful also in much, and whoever is dishonest in a very little is dishonest also in much. If then you have not been faithful with the dishonest wealth, who will entrust to you the true riches? As we've said each week, a parable is a story that throws alongside elements of everyday life with a moral teaching. And one of the first things that we do as we begin to discuss and untangle these parables is we look at the characters in the parable. So let's take a minute, go back through what we just read, and list out all the characters that you notice. What characters did you find in this story? I found at least three, and I think you can make an argument for many, many more. First, we have a rich man. Then we have the manager. And finally, we have this group called the debtors. And the story describes two particular debtors, but it indicates that there may be many more. Now, the rich man and the debtors act just as we expect them to act. They are flat characters for this story. The rich man finds out that the manager has squandered the estate, and he, so he intends to fire the manager. This is what we expect. The debtors have what they owe marked down by the manager, and they are delighted. And of course, this is what we expect. But the interesting character is the manager. The manager who drives the action of the story and it's the, it's the decisions the manager makes that Jesus points us to when he evaluates this parable at the very end of our reading. So what does the manager do? Well, he finds out that he's going to be fired. And he decides that he has to secure his future prospects. So he cooks up a plan to do that. Now, this is not the only plan he could have had. It may not even be a great plan. It certainly seems to be an unethical plan, but it is a plan and it, it does what he needs it to do for him. And the plan is that he'll go down all the accounts, he'll call up all the debtors, and he will mark down what they owe the rich man. And the result, there, there are two results of this. One, the manager raises himself in the eyes of the debtors. The debtors are so grateful for this that they, they now love this guy. The second thing this does is put his boss in a bind. So the rich man now is being lauded by such a generous, kind person for, for forgiving part of the debt owed. The rich man can't go back on this now. He's stuck. And the manager has, 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 tied, has twisted his arm here. So that's the result of the manager's action. And it's a plan that does what the manager hopes it will do. But here is the, the question that we have as we read this. What do we make of this manager? Is this manager a, a good guy or a bad guy? Or what do you think? Is the manager incompetent or is he dishonest? Now, Callus covers the story in chapter eight of his book, More Parables from the Backside. And he calls that chapter a second chance for a poor manager. 
But if you read this in your Bible, you might have noticed that you had a different title over this parable. Maybe your title is the parable of the dishonest manager or the parable of the shrewd manager. And if that's what you saw as you were reading it, maybe you found yourself agreeing with that assessment. Now, Callus makes the argument that this manager may not have necessarily been intentionally dishonest. He may simply have been incompetent. And maybe that's the case. And maybe that's where you land as well as you read the story. I'm not so sure because as I read the story and as I read not just our, our NRSV in Luke, but digging down into the Greek behind it, I think there's some indication that this manager really was intentionally dishonest, that this manager isn't a great guy. Things are not on the up and up. From a plot standpoint, um, this seems to be the case in how he, in how he changes the accounts. But even within the story, he is called dishonest in, in our passage in verse 8. He's also called shrewd. That word dishonest in the Greek is adikaios, and it, it literally means unrighteous. There's really no wiggle room around it. And the word shrewd that Luke uses is phronimos. And what's interesting to me about this word, it doesn't get used a whole lot in the Gospel of Luke, but what's interesting to me about this word is that it is used in the Old Testament, in the Greek Old Testament, in Genesis chapter 3, to describe a certain serpent who was called Phronimus, who was called Shrewd. So I'm not convinced that the manager is simply incompetent, but Regardless of where you land on this, is he incompetent? Is he willfully dishonest? We still have another question to answer, which is, as we read this parable, where do we identify ourselves? And where do we identify God? I would love to know what associations you found in this parable. As we have studied parables over the spring, we have come across some characters like the ones we have in this parable. And so as we think back to the parable of the tenant farmers, for instance, we had a landowner, we had another rich man. And in that parable, we said that that character, that, that landowner, that rich man character was associated with God the Father. So we might make a similar association here. Now, if we do that, then the question becomes, who, who is the manager? There are a few options for this. So in the parable of the tenant farmers, the tenant farmers, the, the, the people who were administering the land, like this manager is administering the estate, those were associated with the corrupt religious leaders of Jesus' day. We could make that connection here and say that this manager, and it's particularly because he's dishonest, he's squandering the estate, it, he's mismanaging just as the corrupt religious leaders were mismanaging the, the estate of God. Now, if we follow this allegory all the way through, then the debtors, maybe, the debtors become sinful, ordinary people like you and me, whose sin has to be mediated through that dishonest manager, or through those corrupt religious leaders. This is one way that we might think of the parable. Callus goes down this path of the, the rich man is associated with God the Father, but he instead puts us in the position of the manager. And he says that what we are to learn from this story is that we have a choice of how we will manage the gifts that God has given us. So are we going to squander them or are we going to be creative and wise in how we manage what we have been 
given. And, and he gets here because of what Jesus says after this parable, which is if you've been faithful in a few things, you'll be faithful in many things. And so he draws some inspiration from that statement to say, well, this is a, a presenting us with, it, with an illustration that shows we have a choice how we're going to manage things. And we should, of course, choose to manage them wisely. Now, there is a third way of reading this parable. And that is that God isn't in this parable. This is a parable about a dishonest manager and a manager who acts, um, who really chooses to do something very under the table and then whose, whose rich boss commends him for it. So the end of this story leaves a bad taste in our mouth because not only has the manager been called uh, a squanderer and dishonest, he's proven himself to be that way by making these side deals with the debtors, and then the rich man commends him. So maybe the rich man isn't so squeaky clean either. And in that case, this is simply an example drawn from real life of how the world tends to work. If you want to climb this ladder, you have to play by the rules, and those rules run a bit counter to the rules that you feel called to live by if you are a person of faith or a Christian. There's something else here, though, and, and it's something else that makes this even more confusing, and that's the commentary Jesus offers at the end of the parable, where he says, make friends for yourself by dishonest wealth. He, he uses this term a couple times, dishonest wealth. And when he uses that, that word dishonest wealth, that dishonest is the same word used to describe the manager, right? He was a dishonest manager. And the Greek behind this word literally means unrighteous, as, as I already said. So what is this unrighteous wealth? Well, it just seems to be money. Use money in a way that makes you friends. Or maybe put differently, be generous with your money. Be generous. If we had to say something good about this manager, we could say that at the very least, in the end, his actions were generous. He let people off the hook. He forgave their debt. And as people who worship a savior who we believe forgives our debt, Maybe if we're going to take something from it, if we're going to hold this person up as an example, maybe what we could learn is to be a little more generous with our accounting. That's not a satisfying answer. And I don't know if there is a satisfying answer to this parable. It's what makes this such a great parable because as a good parable draws you in and invites uh, debate, this parable does just that. And so I wanna close with, with this question, no matter where you landed on how you interpreted this parable, how does this parable call you to live differently this week? Thank you for being part of Thursday Bible Study. Until next time, may the Lord bless you, be gracious to you, and give you peace.